Mountains inspire us with their beauty, challenge us to climb their lofty peaks, and bring us to a sense of stability in an ever-changing world. They stand above their surroundings, seemingly immovable and never changing. But the history of the Colorado Rockies tells us this isn't necessarily so. In this video, we will explore beautiful rock formations that have an unexpected story to tell us. Unbelievably, they reveal that great mountain ranges once existed here, were completely removed, and then reborn in the very same place. Hello, I'm Myron Cook. I'm here at the iconic Red Rocks uh, Amphitheater. It's a natural amphitheater here near Morrison, Colorado. And I have great memories here because I came here in 2015 to see Alan Jackson perform here. And I just remember enjoying uh, the geology and the music at the same time. It doesn't get better than that for me anyway. And also I think John Denver had a feeling of that because he said this was his very favorite place. He performed here 17 times. The very first time he performed in 1972, uh, he introduced the song Colorado Rocky Mountain High. And he wished he could have everyone come here and do all his performances here. So he certainly loved it. Now, in my imaginary world, I wish I could have John Denver here right with us and we'd all learn together of the great mysteries that these Red Rocks uh, unveil to us. And also, it's rather surprising what they tell us. So let's get started making some observations. One of the first observations that we can make that's pretty straightforward is that these layers are dipping like this at about 30 degrees. And back behind me over here, is the mountain that they seem to almost be laying upon. From above, we can clearly see the red layers of rock known as the fountain formation pointing into the sky. Notice that the slope of the mountain hillside and that of the red rocks are pretty similar. And from an even higher view, we can note that the red formations seem to be within a valley defined by this hogback or ridge on the right and the mountain on the left. The amphitheater is right here and seats about 9,000 people. Now as far as the composition of these red rocks, they have a lot of feldspar in them. And uh, geologists uh, think, uh, think of those as immature, meaning they haven't moved very far. And it's typically an arid climate because those feldspars break down very quickly into clays and soils and things if you have a, uh, a more rainy environment. This sample almost looks like granite, doesn't it? But in reality, it's a very coarse-grained sandstone named Arcos. The term Arcos is used due to the abundance of feldspars. The pink-colored class are made of potassium feldspar, the light-colored ones are mostly quartz, and the small dark class are made of biotite and amphibole. Sometimes you see lenses of conglomerate with very large class. The presence of this conglomerate, along with all of the fragile feldspars in these beautiful red rocks, indicate that the sands and rocks didn't travel very far before coming to their final resting place here at Red Rocks Amphitheater. To add context, one of the first things a geologist would do is to investigate the mountainside. I tried to access it via this parking lot, but the entire area is posted as no trespassing. Fortunately, I was able to gather a lot of information by looking along the fence line. Even from a distance, to my eye, the rock outcrops look like basement rock. There were some rocks next to the fence that I could photograph. Here's a nice sample of granite. The very large crystals of potassium feldspar in this sample suggest to me that it comes from a pegmatite. The subtle banding in this sample indicates that it's a metamorphic rock. And the dark colored rock appears to be an amphibole gneiss, which is a metamorphic rock. With these observations in hand, geologists would begin to answer questions that they had been asking themselves, such as what is the source of these deposits? How widespread are they? And very importantly, how old are they? I'm thinking many of you are beginning to formulate ideas as to the origin of these red rocks. You're probably thinking, well, we have a mountain nearby. It's composed of granite and metamorphics, uh, and it has a very similar composition to what we see in the sandstone and conglomerates of the red rocks. So isn't it simply just the erosion of the mountain that 
that forms this apron of material eroding off onto the side of the mountain? Maybe it's an alluvial fan. Yeah, I think so. In fact, Arcos is very commonly associated with alluvial fans, so I think this is a real possibility. But there is a twist, and it's a really big twist. Here's a clue. It has something to do with the relationship of the Red Rocks to that striking hogback ridge we've seen. I have a question for you to ponder. Do you think the Red Rocks are older or younger than the rocks that form the hogback? And how would you determine that? For geologists, this would be a relatively simple thing to determine, but in this case, they would begin to question the obvious. I think it's time to see these deposits elsewhere. Looking south along the front range, we see the red rocks in the foreground. Notice the hog back stretching into the distance. Let's go to Roxborough State Park. As I enjoy these majestic outcrops of towering red rock layers, my mind attempts to grasp the profound earth history they represent. To me, they stand as a witness to a great collision of continents long ago. I thought I would hike up the side of the mountain to get a nice view. I'm west of the red rocks. Uh, I'm actually on the basement rock that these red rocks sit upon. So it's turning into be a pretty good little hike to get up here, but I'm enjoying it. Along the trail, I see basement rock like this granite, which indicates that the mountains to the west are likely the source of all the Arcos in the valley below me. What a view! And there's so much to see here. On the left is the mountain composed of basement rock. Then we see a broad valley with lots of homes built in it. The valley is composed of loosely consolidated Arcosic sands and conglomerates. Then we see the consolidated or lithified red rocks which stand in relief because they are resistant to erosion. If you look carefully, you can see the red rocks extending into the distance. Both the valley and the red rocks make up the fountain formation which is about 2,000 feet thick in this area. Amazing place to hike around in. I hope you get the chance to do that here in South Denver. I've really enjoyed it, uh, thinking about the history that these wonderful red rocks are revealing to me. And I have to go back to the early geologists in the late 1800s and the early 1900s and think what they were thinking as they came to these great formations. I think I have a good idea what the initial discussions were. That's pretty simple. They would look at the rock. It looks like weathered granite. It's practically granite. It has so much feldspar in it. It hasn't been transported far. It's very unstable as feldspar is. And I think it just eroded off the granite peaks of the great Colorado Rockies right here. I mean, we have granite and some metamorphic rocks and stuff exposed right here in the Colorado Rockies. It just weathered off and created a great apron of um, alluvial fans. And that seems, well, pretty straightforward. Yeah, okay, okay. And then they go to their camp that night and they start to discuss things. And geologists like to do this. They have their discussions around the campfire. And one geologist would say, uh, you know, I think these great layers, this, the red rocks, I actually think they go down in the ground and continue down. Now, why is that important? I'm asking you, the audience, think about that. Why would that be important? And another geologist would follow up and say, yeah, if that's true, this is creating a problem because I think that great ridge that you can see that runs along the Colorado Rockies, clear along the Front Range, I think that's the Morrison Formation and that's Jurassic Age. Geologists would have known that the slope on this ridge is Morrison formation and that the resistant sandstones capping the ridge are the Cretaceous Age Dakota formation. 
In fact, the Morrison gets its name from the small community of Morrison, Colorado nearby. Both are known for their dinosaur bones and trackways. The Morrison was deposited about 150 million years ago and then 85 million years later was uplifted and eroded into this fantastic hogback during the formation of the Colorado Rockies. That's older than the Colorado Rockies, that formation, and it's sitting here on top of, maybe, does it, on top of these red rocks. This creates a big problem. We've got to think this through. We need to make some more observations, and so they did. Leaving Roxboro Park, we go even further south along the front of the magnificent Colorado Rockies to a special place near the city of Colorado Springs. Garden of the Gods, Colorado Springs, Colorado. What an amazing place. I can't think of a better name for it. The aesthetics of it alone are just overwhelming. And then you combine that with the geology and boy, what a powerful impression it makes on me. Now back to our story of these deposits. We need to start to come to a conclusion as to whether these are alluvial fan deposits shedding off the Rocky Mountains right back here Right today, we have granite, big, steep, tall mountains. Seems reasonable. Or were they something else? Did something occur earlier? And one of the keys to that is, do the rock layers go down under the ground? Do they continue deep into the earth? That turns out to be an important clue. And I hope you have some thoughts as to whether you think these layers continue down, and down into the earth just by the observations. So with that, we're going to have to have a whiteboard discussion. Two parts to my sketch here. Let's focus on this one. And as you can see, I've drawn my little tree here to show us that this is a cross-sectional view. We're looking sideways in both of these sketches, by the way. Let's focus here first. This lower big thick layer I have with the little check marks, that's basement rock granite and metamorphic rocks. And then over the top of that were deposited lots of other layers of rocks. Could be thousands of feet of rock deposited. This is before any deformation or mountain building uh, occurred. Now we take these layers of rocks and we fold them into a mountain over here. Now, so I've folded everything like so. I have yet to show erosion. We have to remember, as the mountain's being uplifted, this takes a long time, easily 15 million years, a big mountain. It's being eroded as it's being uplifted. But I want to show this with the uneroded version. So we've folded them all like this. Now we need to think about how this mount, a mountain erodes. Now the fun begins. We get to erode these mountains. Of course, as I said, they're being eroded as they're being uplifted, but let me start the erosion here. We just erode deeper and deeper into that mountain, and eventually we're going to get to basement rock. So let me do that. I won't make it too complicated, like so. And that basement rock will stand up tall. So I've redrawn my surface of erosion here to make it easier to understand. We have the high peaks uh, in the core of the mountain. Uh, granite and metamorphic rocks are resistant to erosion. They ten tend to stand up tall. On the sides of the mountain, we have these uh, original layers, uh, sedimentary layers that were on the basement over here. And we have this continuing erosion. Now, I want you to think about something. What would an alluvial fan complex look like from eroding this granite as it came off, off the mountain? Do you have a vision what it might do, how it might appear? I'll bet you do. Let me draw it in here as just a, a simple sketch. I'll just put a red line here. These red deposits would be the alluvial fan complex coming out off these granite highlands. Ah. This is rather straightforward, but there's uh, really some key relationships we need to understand. Look at how these uh, deposits come across the strata, the formations that are dipping on the side of the mountain here. They're coming this way across them. And I don't think we observe that. And that's why I was asking the question of, uh, do these red rocks, are they dipping down into the ground, like parallel to these rocks? 
or maybe are they just sitting on top and we can't really tell? Because if they're dipping into the ground, that means there's something very different that occurred here. And, and so I'll sketch that out. Yet another sketch. This will be the last one for this stop. But this is more or less what I think we're observing and what the geologists eventually decided they were observing. We have the great Colorado Rockies that we're all familiar with, the basement rock, much basement rock. We have sedimentary layers out, strung out away from the mountain, just classic, but tucked right in here are these alluvial fan deposits. Uh, very classic, Arcos, alluvial fan deposits, and they do plunge deep into the earth. And what they're not doing, what they're not doing is coming out across like this, out across the rocks. They're going down into the ground. Let's review a partial sequence of geologic events. We deposit a thick sequence of arcos on top of basement rock. More layers of rock are deposited on top of the fountain formation. Then the Morrison and Dakota formations were deposited. There were thousands of feet of additional formations deposited on top of this, which I won't get into. Then, about 85 million years after the deposition of the Morrison, all these layers of rocks were uplifted, tilted, and folded, then finally eroded into their present-day configuration. With this sequence of events in mind, we now know that the fountain formation is much, much older than the Colorado Rockies. Wow, that has some serious implications. Because there's really only one way to explain that. These did come off mountains. They had to have. Granite was exposed to the surface and being eroded. But they didn't come off these mountains. They must have come off some mountains that existed prior much prior to the Colorado Rockies, which formed about 65 million years ago. And we'll continue to learn about this and figure out how this was determined and, and the shape and the size of these mountains as we continue our journey. Geologists determined that these deposits are very old indeed. They're Pennsylvanian age. They were deposited over a 15 million year period starting about 315 million years ago. The fountain formation was mapped all along the Front Range, including the iconic flat irons of Boulder. In some areas they found it to be 4,500 feet thick. The mountains that source these beautiful alluvial fan deposits are referred to as the Ancestral Rocky Mountains. We've seen the alluvial fans that define the eastern side of the Ancestral Rockies, but what about the western side? Where is it? What does it look like? Working our way westward along Interstate 70, near to the community of Eagle, we see some familiar looking Arcos deposits. Indeed, the red slopes are Pennsylvanian, Permian, and Triassic Age Arcos deposits very similar to what we saw along the Front Range. Could this be the western side of the ancestral Rocky Mountains? With the canyon we just visited in the foreground, we continue westward along I-70. I'm sure seeing a lot of red-colored rock. Continuing westward to the community of Glenwood Springs, there sure seems to be an abundance of Arcos. In this area, the alluvial fan deposits are an impressive 4,000 feet thick or so, and are Pennsylvanian in age. Maybe we've finally arrived at the western edge of the ancestral Rockies. This is fun. We are doing what early geologists did. We're following sedimentary deposits to learn about ancient landscapes. Westward we go. Here are the Uncompahgre Mountains, and here are the LaSalle Mountains near Moab, Utah. Our destination is here. I'm about 25 miles east of Moab, not too far from the Colorado uh, border, at Fisher Towers. I came here, obviously, to see red deposits like this, which I think look familiar to you. Uh, boy, I enjoyed the walk into this location here. And the whole time I was thinking about the ancestral Rockies and the history involved here. Wow. And here, these deposits are actually younger. They're Permian age. So 
the alluvial fan system out here continued to build uh, later into time, into the Permian, whereas the fountain formation on the other side is Pennsylvanian in age. But there are also Pennsylvanian age uh, alluvial fan deposits here under the ground here, which we can't see. These rocks here are super cool, but I didn't come here to show you these outcrops. I came to show you Fisher Towers, what I'm looking at right now behind the camera. Spectacular. From this contact down to the valley floor is all Permian Age Cutler Formation and our alluvial fan deposits. The upper layers are part of the Triassic Age Moencope Formation and are not related to the ancestral Rockies. It turns out that in southern Utah there are a lot of red colored formations. Deep time. 300 million years ago. Boy, the world looked a lot different then, didn't it? This is the state of Colorado right here. And the, these mountain ranges all through here are the ancestral Rockies. Uh, they're known by different names for different parts. These, this is the ancestral front range, and these are the ancestral Uncompahgre Mountains. Now, we started on a drive on I-70 going westward. We went from these alluvial fans we were looking at along here, crossed through the mountains, and we got to uh, near the community of Eagle, and we started seeing uh, these alluvial fan deposits again, these red deposits. Then we went over to Glenwood Springs, and there they are again, great thicknesses of them. We crossed the border, went around the corner just a bit, right to here, and yet again at Fisher Towers we see these alluvial fan deposits. Now geologists go around and document where these deposits are at this particular interval, and they put a map together like this, and here we have these tan areas and whatnot around the mountains to represent these alluvial deposits. Notice also that we have a seaway here, on the west side of the Uncompagres, and that seaway is a form uh, <clears throat> as a foreland basin and is, and is known as the Paradox Basin. Isn't this a wonderful map? I know you've been looking in other areas of this map, and especially for those of you that live in the eastern United States, would be noticing these this huge mountain range, which was the uh, Appalachian Mountains in their full glory. I mean, this was about 300 million years ago. It was the last collision that occurred of Africa colliding with North America. This is the state of Pennsylvania, by the way, for reference, and forming the Great Appalachian Mountains. Now, this collision didn't all occur at once. It, it collided and kind of rotated and sutured together around the corner, I like to think of it that way, continuing to build other mountain ranges, such as the Awachitas and the Marathons, and our ancestral Rocky Mountains. Now, an interesting thing about this is this is far inland, these ancestral Rocky Mountains, and there's been a, quite a bit of debate as to why that happened so far inland. Let's talk about this Foreland Basin here on the west side of the Encompagres a little bit more, shall we? Uh, and I have a question for you to think about. How does this Foreland Basin affect the deposition of these alluvial fan deposits? And in particular, I want you to think about how thick these deposits, these alluvial deposits, might be along the edge of the, of the Foreland Basin. And I think to understand this, we're, we're going to have to go to the whiteboard. Here I have a cross-sectional view of a Foreland Basin. So on the left side here is the mountain being uplifted. I've put a great big fault here. Uh, the arrow showing that the mountain's going up. Uh, this is basement rock with the small checks here. And the sedimentary rock that, that was on top of the mountain, at least initially, is this layer here, and it's over here, so it's been faulted. And I have some seawater coming in in the low area that developed. Now, the low area developed because the mountain, as it's being uplifted, as brings in a lot of mass. This compression adds mass or weight weighs down the crust and depresses that area and creates that Foreland Basin. Now let's think about how these alluvial fans uh, build up, shedding off the mountain out into the seawater, right out into the Foreland Basin. I'll sketch that in here. Of course, there's going to be some on top, on the side of the mountain here, and it's going to kind of come out into the ocean. Now, 
once it enters the ocean water, they refer to it as these, not as alluvial fans, but as fan deltas. But these fans, they come out and they just fill in a bunch of coarse grain material, fan material, right out into the ocean. That makes really good sense, doesn't it? An interesting part of this is early, if you think about it, these uh, fans are composed of sedimentary rocks, eroded sedimentary rocks. It hasn't eroded into the basement. And that's what's initially uh, dumped into the, into the ocean here. This sketch is early in time as this mountain's being uplifted and the Foreland Basin is formed. In fact, I show sedimentary rocks on top of the mountain that have yet to be eroded. Of course, there has been some erosion that I haven't sketched here. But as this mountain continues to go up, it's adding more and more mass, which means the basin is going down more and more, uh, dropping down through time, creating more and more space here for sediment to infill. And we have more sediment available because, boy, this mountain is growing and filling in. So let me show you a sketch later in time. I want to pause and give you a chance to imagine this sketch about 10 million years into the future when the mountains are fully uplifted and the basin is at its greatest depth. What might the sediment fill in the basin look like? In particular, what would the geometry of the alluvial deposits be? How thick would they be? So here we are. First of all, is this kind of what you had envisioned in your mind? I hope it was something kind of close. Maybe some of you got it right on or pretty close anyway. Uh, boy, have we uplifted the mountain here, brought it way up. And also, we've eroded all the sedimentary rocks that were on top of this mountain and have eroded deep into the basement. And the basin just continued to, to go down, and as it was going down, it was just filling in all along. And the seed water depth that I've got here was always fairly similar. It, it had a nice balance. And... Also, we have a lot of alluvium here on the sides of the mountain here as, as the mountain's being eroded. More and more alluvium here and just stacked it really thick here. In fact, in this case, that's 16,000 feet of, of alluvium somewhere right in there. That's three Grand Canyons. Now, that's hard to get your head around. I'm a big believer in visualizing geology, and modern analogs can be very helpful in this process. One of the best places to see vast amounts of alluvium eroding off of mountains is the Mojave Desert. This area is quite similar to how I visualized the ancestral Rockies not too long after their formation, a hot, arid environment with alluvial fans building at the base of the mountains. Through time, the mountains become smaller and the alluvial fans get larger and larger. As even more time passes, I see a great plain of alluvium with only a few small remnants of the once great mountains poking through. I have another Blakey map. Now this is 150 million years ago in the Jurassic and immediately we see that, wow, the mountain ranges are gone. If we look at the Colorado-Utah border, for instance, where the Uncompagre uplift was, the ancestral Uncompagres, and they had been eroded completely down, right down to the roots, to ground level, so to speak. And now it allowed the great Aeolian dune fields, the windblown dunes, they're referred to as ergs, these giant dune fields begin to cover this whole region where these great mountains once were. Sunrise at Arches National Park. I hike along the top of petrified dunes of the Navajo Formation and I visualize a great sea of sand as far as the eye can see. These dunes were one of the first deposits to completely cover the weathered, beaten down ancestral Rockies. I struggle to fully grasp that this once majestic mountain range would no longer grace the landscape. Over the next 130 million years, thick rock formations were deposited by great deserts, coastal deserts, lush and forested land that harbored dinosaurs, and finally the Great Cretaceous Interior Sea. 
The total amount of sediment deposited during this period was about 6,000 feet. The last whiteboard discussion, and I think it's probably the most important one because this summarizes all these geologic events, and th this represents the ancestral Rockies later in their life. They've been eroded down a fair bit, down into this basement rock here. I show some big faults here. The Paradox Basin is pretty full of sediment, essentially full, and there's still some continuing alluvium shedding off the mountains, but erosion keeps going and more history is to come. So let me erode the mountains. So here we go. Erosion continues to cut down these mountains right across, weathering clear down deep into the granite and eroding it away down and building up alluvium. And new deposits were to be deposited on top of that. The heavy red line here are all the alluvial deposits that had built up on top of the, the mountains that were once there and, and spread out beyond through time. And now that the mountains are completely eroded away, a new deposition comes in on top of that. So let me try to do that here. Put, put one layer here. This represents, oh, about 6,000 feet of sedimentary layers that build up over the top of these once wonderful mountains. Now the stage is set for the uplift of the modern Colorado Rocky Mountains, the second phase, the rebirth of these mountains. And they're to come up in much the same area. And I have a question for you. Why would that be? You, you think about why would they come up in the, almost in some places the exact same place? Well, it's because you have inherent weaknesses in the crust that, that developed during the, the uplift of the ancestral Rockies. We have these faults and folds and you have a weak place. Now when you recompress all this, it's going to tend to come right up in the same place. It makes sense. I like that because that's the way geology often is. This sketch is getting a bit complicated. I had to do a lot of drawing here. But before we move to this big fold, I want to come back here. These alluvial deposits, notice that they're flat. I mean, everything eroded down to pretty close to sea level. So it's all very flat, all these alluvial deposits now. And the new deposits that come on top of those are flat, horizontal, essentially. So now when we fold them in this big fold, they're all quite parallel, like so. And this big fold, of course, results in the modern Rocky Mountains that we enjoy so much today. And I haven't shown erosion, so let's do that. So after erosion of this big uplift, which I depicted as a very simple big fold, which is not the case, it's quite, quite a bit more complicated than that, but I wanted to do that to keep it simple. Uh, there was the biggest part of the modern uplift is the front range, and the, uh, the Uncompagri Mountains are quite a bit smaller out over here. But let's focus over here on the front range because we did a lot of work there. Uh, see what we see. We have the, the uh, alluvial fan deposits are parallel to basement, and they're sitting right on basement rock. And they're parallel to the other layers like we saw. And there isn't much alluvium coming off the mountains now. There are some areas that there are alluvial fan deposits, but it doesn't seem to be as significant. And likewise, over here, we have uh, exposed alluvium deposits out here uh, near Moab. We also have some in the Eagle Valley area, uh, which I won't get into. It gets into some complexities here, but they're preserved over in this area. The rebirth of these great mountains resulted in the exposure of the alluvial fans that had been entombed for over 130 million years, which provided beautiful landscapes for us to enjoy. Isn't the geologic history of our Earth amazing? I hope you've enjoyed learning about the ancestral Rocky Mountains. I know I sure enjoyed making this video, and I feel very fortunate to present this information to you. Thanks for watching.